Right. I feel like we as, and I think this is probably extends to pretty much any nation or any society uh, on the planet right now, but we're very much, we're very caught up in ideas or um, the symbol, the sim- the symbolic nature of things. So to me, uh, having a black president symbolically is a big deal. But when you actually look at his policies, like you mentioned, he's a uh, bragged or, or joked or whatever it was about being a moderate Republican, the actual mm-hmm. political reality of where we are right now in the United States, is we've shifted so far to the right that what we think of as progressive or leftist is really not. And so in actuality, yep. having him as president, I feel like it, it actually, because of the symbolic nature of his presidency, it actually worked to obscure what the president's role actually is in perpetuating not just white supremacy, but just the U.S. empire globally. Yes. Uh, if you look at what he did as a president and the decisions he made, um, he really was as uh, militarily aggressive um, mm-hmm. as his previous pre- as previous presidents. Um, yes, he was. Yeah, just wanted to get your thoughts on that. <laughs> sure. Well, and anybody who was paying attention knew he was going to do that. He, uh, uh, during the campaign, he was painted as, uh, especially during his primary race against Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton had voted to support the invasion of Iraq. Mm-hmm. And now he wasn't in the Senate yet. And uh, he was asked once how he would have voted. And he said he didn't know. Uh, but he, um, he was marketed as the uh, peace candidate, which he wasn't. And he said, he said, I'm not against wars. I'm not I'm just against dumb wars Mm. and dumb wars meant using U S troops to invade as Mm. was done in Iraq, uh, which proved to eventually be very unpopular. It was one of the reasons the Republicans had such a low approval rating by the time he uh, ran in 2008. Um, And so he, but still an imperialist, that's how one of the ways you get to be president. Um, So he, uh, did uh, what some of his predecessors did. So they destroyed Libya with the help of jihadist proxies. Now, that's a policy that goes back to Jimmy Carter. Uh, Jimmy Carter um, uh, giving arms and uh, uh, money to the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Mm. Uh, That's been U.S. policy ever since. So he did that in Libya. He tried to do that in uh, Syria. And it was just as deadly. Libya was just as uh, destroyed, just as much as Iraq was. They tried to do the same thing to Syria. Uh, Fortunately, Russia came in finally to uh, assist assist Syria and make sure there were no jihadists uh, left to bother Russia, which is the reason they did it. But yes, absolutely. He, um, you know, he couched it in beautiful language. It was humanitarian assistance. And uh, so if you're going to destroy Libya, you have to say that Gaddafi was a tyrant and um, his troops were going to, you know, take Viagra and, you know, rape every woman in sight and mm. um, uh, and get buy-in from these horrible organizations, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, who don't do what people think they do. They usually end up supporting uh, U.S. aggressions. Mm. Uh, so, so, yes, he did, he did the same thing. Uh, the same things, um, but uh, but but he got a pass. There was this. Um, there was so much hope placed in him, you know. Especially speaking of Libya, if if nobody in the United States would defend Gaddafi, black people would defend Gaddafi. But Obama's the one who got him killed, so nobody or very few people said anything about it. Mm. So yes, he did what uh, presidents do: the sanction sanctioning of countries. Um, the invasions, the drone strikes, this uh, claim that the president had the right to assassinate anybody for any reason anywhere on the earth, and even American citizens were not immune. Uh, so yes, he did what he did what other presidents did. Mm, yes. And I, I do want to point to this term, uh, black misleadership class. Now, this was a recent column that you wrote for Black Agenda Report. Uh, the title of that is Joe Biden and the Black Misleaders. And I think mm-hmm. that the very beginning of that, uh, to quote here, a uh, very short uh, quote here, uh, you say, The black misleadership class has no shame, only narrow ambitions. They are now called out to rescue the man 
who looks very much like a loser. And that man you're referring to is Joe Biden, who of course, is running for president mm-hmm. and served as vice president under Barack Obama. Could you explain that term, that the, the idea of what the black misleadership class is? Yes, it's a term we uh, coined at Black Agenda Report. They are the people who benefited. Actually, this class was uh, created in the wake of the liberation movement, the people who were co-opted with some degree of success. Mm. Um, you know, the system doesn't, doesn't, doesn't just, uh, the people who run the system don't just sit around uh, quaking in their boots whenever ever there's uh, uh, opposition and protest. So they, uh, affirmative action began and black people were admitted to schools they didn't get into before and had some opportunities they didn't get before. And they expanded the number of uh, members of the Congressional Black Caucus. Mm. Uh, um, The philanthropists gave money to the civil rights organization and created this cohort of people who are very much, much interested in defending the system. But because they are black, they are mistakenly thought to be representing the interests of the larger group, but they are not. They're protecting their the interests of their class, and they can be very dangerous. We saw this in the uh, primary election where the Democrats um, made getting rid of Bernie Sanders their first priority, and uh, they finally settled on Joe Biden, mm. uh, proof that I, I think that they don't really even care about winning but uh anyhow yeah so they they settle on biden they use uh south carolina has become south carolina primary has become very important so congressman clyburn becomes important he endorses biden um and uh, they use a variety of uh ruses against uh, sanders and kill his uh chances of getting the nomination and of course sanders capitulated also unfortunately. Yes. So that is just the most, the latest and most public example of what these people do. Uh, now they, and they, they're all solidly behind Biden, who is a, a train wreck by any definition. Um, the only way he can win is if the Democrats uh, stop doing what they've done before. They have to protect the black vote. They have to have a, a kick-ass get-out-the-vote effort, which they didn't have in 2016, which is why Trump is president instead of Hillary Clinton. Uh, they have to do all of those things to pull him over the finish line. And he's, he's horrible. He is, um, Obama chose him because he's a conservative Democrat. So Obama was um, thought to be more liberal in order to get buy-in from uh the even more conservative wing of the party, he picked uh, Joe Biden, who was always a mediocrity, uh, always a um, uh, at, at best a mediocrity, and what is the what is the term gaff prone, which means yeah. stupid. But he, you know, he's one of these people who bragged about the uh, the uh, legislation in the '90s during the Clinton administration that sent so many black people to jail. Many racist statements over the years, as bad as I, I believe, as some of Trump's statements. But he is the neoliberal choice, and that's what the black misleader class, misleadership class, is interested in doing. Their success, their um, their prominence. Their prosperity depends on neoliberal policy continuing. And as Biden was heard to say before a group of fat cat funders, if I'm president, nothing fundamentally is going to change. Mm -hmm. So uh, as he's already said, no Medicare for all. Uh, He's he's even not challenging some of uh, some of the Obama foreign policy that Trump changed. So. Uh, the Iran nuclear deal, which was a big, uh, an important Obama initiative uh, opposed by Republicans. And uh, uh, but now Biden is like, well, we have to see the Iranians could be lying. They could be cheating, you know, and not living up to their side of the bargain. So he says he's not he's not even promising to undo something that Trump did which undid something that Obama did. Mm. Uh, so uh, so that's the black misleadership class. And we see Stacey Abrams, uh, you know, doing, being very obvious about wanting to be chosen as vice president. But, but she's one of those uh, 
uh, people that I have described. And she is she was cheated out of the gubernatorial race in Georgia. That is true. But uh, so she has lived off of that. And she gets a little more progressive uh, uh, credibility for um, uh, having uh, had that experience. But but basically, she is uh, among the black misleaders. And as already said, she'll defend. Uh, she already defended Joe Biden and said she believed him instead of Tara Reid's sexual assault allegation. And she and others were among the Believe All Women crowd until uh, Biden was the one who was accused. Mm. Uh, so uh, so those are the black misleaders. And um, uh, that is uh, what they do and why they are uh, so, uh, so dangerous to us. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I guess to tie back into your research into the presidents and the history of the United States, when did this black misleadership class, as you've described it, really begin to emerge and become a part of, um, I guess, the political institutions or, or the establishment, as you could say, in the United States, uh, serving the role that it does in, I, I, I imagine, perpetuating some of the worst aspects of the U.S. presidency and uh, and U.S. society and culture at large? I mean, where did that really begin to form in U.S. history? I think it started in the 70s, uh, in the mm. wake of the liberation movement, the destruction of the liberation movement. And that destruction took a brutal form, as with COINTELPRO and the uh, jailing of political prisoners and the killing of uh, people such as uh, Fred Hampton. Mm-hmm. But um, uh, it also was a, uh, you know, a softer approach of letting people in and uh, giving people who did not have uh, uh, certain opportunities before, letting them get a taste of what uh, had been reserved for white people in, uh, in years past. So that is when it began. And so then you had the first black this or that, uh, more black members of Congress, uh, a few more black senators, black mayors, but uh, uh, they all, um, very few of them actually differed from their white predecessors. Mm. And uh, so that uh, the black mayors of Atlanta are relatively conservative. Maynard Jackson was the first black mayor, but the first thing he did was fire striking black uh, public workers. And that is, um, that's how they, how they operate. Um, also, um, it became clear uh, in order to get black people to move to the right, that that didn't work because black people aren't voting for Republicans, even if the Republicans are black, that's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. So they were attacked with money. They had for a long time, black politicians had been left alone. There was an understanding they were going to be more left wing than others. But then some of them were targeted for defeat. And uh, they many of them were bought off, some of them happily by uh, corporate interests. So uh, Congressman Clyburn, who I just mentioned, is one of the biggest recipient of money from Big Pharma, um, campaign funds from Big Pharma. Mm. And uh, he was, uh, I thought it was funny when he said, well, Bernie Sanders never asked for my endorsement. I mean, come on, the guy who wants <laughs> Medicare for all, is gonna, you're going to endorse him, Mr. Big Pharma Congressman? Come on, oh, you're not going to endorse Bernie Sanders. But but that is um, uh, uh, how they they do it. So now they're like everybody else. The Black Caucus used to be for a long time, even into the 80s, actually. They were maybe early 90s even. They were the uh, they were called the conscience of the Congress. They were the reliably progressive wing. But uh, once they began to depend on uh, uh, big money um, to stay in office, they became like everybody else.